Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on Longshore ESG strategies for endowments. My name is Nicole Harmon. I'm a program manager with the Intentional Endowments Network, and I'm very pleased to have with me three great panelists to share their experience and expertise on this topic today. We'll be hearing from Matthew Bloom, Director of ESG Research and a Wealth Manager at Appleseed Capital, Tim O'Donnell, Senior Vice President of Fund Evaluation Group, and Paul Herman, CEO of Hip Investor. After our panelists' presentations, we'll spend the remainder of the hour in dialogue responding to your questions, so please enter them throughout the presentation in the chat function of the control panel at any time, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to all registrants by email and will also be available on our website shortly after it's completed so you can refer back to this conversation and share it with others and we can also make slides available upon request. So just briefly before we dive in, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Intentional Endowments Network, we are a nonprofit collaborative peer learning network with the goal of supporting endowments and enhancing performance by aligning investments with institutional mission values and sustainability goals. And we do this in a variety of ways, including hosting in-person forums and events, facilitating peer networking, curating useful resources on sustainable investing opportunities, and providing educational venues such as webinars like this one. We encourage you to stay engaged in these conversations after today's webinar. More information on IEN is available on our website. You can see a link on this slide, or you're welcome to reach out to us at any time. So with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, and hello, everyone. As Nicole mentioned, my name is Matthew Bloom. Uh, I'm a wealth manager and the director of ESG research at Appleseed Capital. Uh, we're an RIA that's been around for about 28 years. We manage money for high net worth individuals and families, and we, we manage the Appleseed Fund, which is a publicly traded uh, fossil fuel free ESG mutual fund that we launched in uh, 2006. And we also manage a fossil fuel free long short ESG strategy. Uh, across the firm, we, we have about 1 billion in assets under management. Um, today, we'll be discussing incorporation of ESG into long short equity strategies. Uh, but before we dive in too far, I want to do a high-level look uh, at the hedge fund space and then a quick refresher uh, on short selling, just so that everyone's on the same page. So this first slide shows the breadth of strategies in the hedge fund space, as well as the amount of assets invested in various types of hedge fund strategies. Um, clearly, there's a diverse variety of strategies available under the hedge fund umbrella, uh, and with more than $3.5 trillion in AUM, um, hedge funds are, are clearly an important part of investors' portfolio allocations. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we'll actually be looking specifically at the equity long short sector of the hedge fund space today and talking about how we can integrate ESG into those types of strategies. Next slide, please. So what is short selling? Um, put simply, it's borrowing shares of a company selling those shares in the open market, then buying them back at a later date and returning them to the original owner. Uh, the rationale at the most basic level is simply to make money from downward movement in stock prices. Uh, but more importantly, it can be a, a really effective diversifier in a portfolio. And uh, we, we believe that short selling also uh, presents fertile ground for incorporation of ESG factors. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, next slide. So short selling is most commonly incorporated into portfolios through the use of long short equity strategies. Uh, these strategies look to take both long and short positions in stocks with the objective of profiting from increases in the long positions and decreases in prices of the short positions. And they're designed to take advantage of idiosyncratic movement among stocks while reducing the overall exposure to the broad equity market. Um, so why incorporate long short strategies? Next slide, please. Well, the short answer here is, is lower beta, so lower broad equity exposure, less portfolio volatility, next slide, please, and uh, shallower drawdowns. 
Next slide, please. So I, I think these charts, we went through those quickly, but I think these charts um, make the case pretty clearly for these three um, reasons to invest in long short strategies. Next slide, please. So with all of that said, um, what we want to talk about today specifically is addressing the topic of incorporating ESG factors into long short strategies. Uh, long only ESG portfolios are nothing new. Managers have been successfully incorporating these types of factors into their investment decisions for quite some time now. But what's been less common until recently is actively using ESG factors to develop short ideas. Um, while long only managers are using ESG factors to reduce risk and enhance return by owning well-managed and sustainable companies, long short strategies actually look to allow investors to own good companies, but also avoid bad companies and profit from declining stock prices of bad companies. Um, uh, next, slide, next slide, please. So in our long short ESG strategy, um, we look for typical characteristics of compelling short candidates. So th these would include weak balance sheets, rich valuations relative to cash flows, high insider selling, those types of things. But these factors really aren't sufficient on their own for taking a short position. Um, short ideas need near-term catalysts to really drive shares down. And, and this chart here just kind of shows what our, sort of our thinking for how, how it's incorporated in our process. Um, Part of our process for coming up with these ideas includes identifying what we call ESG miscreants. And these are companies whose underlying businesses or management teams are unethical, unsustainable, or unsafe. And these companies tend to have uh, one or more of the following, poor corporate governance, um, high litigation or regulatory risks, or products and services with limited or negative social value. And we generally think that value destructive nature of these types of companies uh, eventually is recognized by customers, regulators, and investors, uh, leading to profits for short sellers. Next slide, please. So by way of example, uh, these are three short ideas that we were no longer involved in, but which had strong ESG components um, to their short theses. The first was Valiant, which is a great example of an unethical company. Um, unethical companies typically are characterized as having weak corporate governance and exhibit behaviors such as constant restructuring and write-offs, uh, conflicts of interest, accounting shenanigans, and complicated uh, financial disclosures. And Valiant really fit this description to a T. Um, in recent years, Valiant had been consolidating financial statements of uh, several specialty pharmacies without disclosing that fact. And eventually it became obvious that these specialty pharmacies were artificially boosting Valiant's results. And, and digging into the issue uncovered a lot of additional problems that were obvious results of unethical or fraudulent uh, management decisions. And so we, we shorted Valiant based partially on this unethical company thesis and um, were handsomely rewarded for doing so. Uh, another example here is CoreCivic, which we categorize as an unsustainable business. Uh, formerly known as Corrections Corporation of America, uh, the company is the largest provider of uh, prison detentions and correction services to U.S. governmental units. And from a larger societal view, uh, privately run prisons have a, a very different mission, I guess, uh, from ones run by govern government agencies. I, by definition, uh, for-profit prisons emphasize profitability above, above everything else. And so as a result, you see really high utilization rates um, leading to overcrowding and unclean conditions. And then when you add in the fact that uh, prison populations are falling, um, government contracts are short, and prison real estate has no other use, um, you have a really strong short thesis. So simply put, we believe the business model of private prisons is unsustainably flawed, and we shorted uh, CoreCivic with this thesis in mind at a time when the company had a really high market valuation, and then that thesis played out in 2016 when the DOJ concluded 
that uh, private prisons don't measure up to, to government run prisons. And then lastly, we have an example of uh, an unsafe business. Um, unsafe businesses typically have dubious business models based on products or services with, I would say, limited or negative social value. Um, and, and ultimately, negative reaction from customers or government regulators uh, have a detrimental impact on the unsustainably high margins or revenues that these companies generate. So Rayonier Advanced Materials, um, as an example, is the biggest producer of cellulose specialty chemicals and supplies more than 50% of the world's market for acetate tow, which is used mainly in cigarette filters. So obviously the company is heavily dependent on the tobacco industry, which faces clear uh, increasing regulatory pressure, high taxes, and a, a negative social stigma. They also have major off balance sheet environmental and pension liabilities, and they're a high cost producer and a price taker in an oversupplied market. Um, so you know that was that was the crux of our our short thesis there. Um, now we're no longer involved in any of these three names. Um, as our theses all played out on these. Uh, however, we're, we're always looking for um, current ESG themes to help us find good short candidates. And you know, some of the most pertinent ESG themes right now um, are, are guns and ammunition and the hashtag MeToo movement. Um, and both of those themes have helped us to find other good sh short candidates, such as uh, Big Five Sporting Goods, which earns roughly 17% of operating profits from the sale of guns and ammo. Uh, and um, guess whose stock we expect to be pressured by the recent accusation from Kate Upton that the company's executive chairman and uh, chief creative officer sexually harassed her when she was employed as a model for the company. Um, so by themselves, these themes wouldn't be sufficient for shorting a stock, but they really are a key part of our process for finding strong uh, short candidates for our long short strategy. Uh, so to conclude, ESG investing, we believe inherently lowers risk by reducing idiosyncratic business risk in a long only portfolio. But shorting stocks with poor ESG performance and, and sort of these ESG themes can actually provide additional alpha while reducing market exposure and adding important diversification to a portfolio of, of long only ESG investments. Um, so now I'll go ahead and hand it over to Tim O'Donnell from FEG Advisors. Thanks, Matt. So <clears throat> by way of introduction, my, my name is Tim O'Donnell. I am Senior Vice President of FEG Advisors. I also head up our responsive investment effort uh, here for the firm. Um, we are um, an investment consulting organization. We provide uh, recommendations. I, I'm sorry, Nicole, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. <clears throat> so we provide uh, investment advice for about 230 uh, clients nationwide, totaling about $62 billion of assets under advisement. <clears throat> what you see here on slide 16 is an example of our higher education clients but you can see in the pie chart, we are fairly diversified. Endowments and foundations, and this is perfectly appropriate given the, the, the audience here, endowments and foundations make up about 80% of the dollars that we advise on. And the, the, the process that we go through is assisting clients in asset allocation, spending policy analysis, manager selection. So there's a whole suite of decisions that need to be made before ultimately the client would make the decision to hire, for example, an organization like Appleseed. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So we provide uh, for our clients that are, that are looking for ESG criteria, responsive investment uh, solutions that are customized specifically for them. Um, every organization is slightly different. So many of the decisions that we need to work our way through is, what is the ultimate goal of employing an ESG strategy to a portfolio? Is it uh, more of a holistic approach to ESG, sort of the general uh, try to do no harm, uh, make money in, the, in, in an ethical manner? Is it issue specific? We have clients that 
specifically don't want to own tobacco, for example. So, you know, we'll go through the process of how we would build out a portfolio with that concern. Um, organizations might have guidelines that they want to follow, like the USCCB or ICCR, some of the more faith-based organizations, or environmental organizations that are looking for divest invest. So all of these organizations, the concept of what is ESG, what is responsive investing, will vary wildly. You know, a faith-based organization and an environmental organization might have two very different approaches in, the, in, the, in an attempt uh, to generate an ESG portfolio. It's also client specific on asset allocation, including liquidity needs. So if you want to go to the next slide. So when we're working with our clients to kind of put together an asset allocation, one of the discussions that we have to have is how much liquidity do we need in the portfolio? So for example, in a long short hedge fund, oftentimes you can't get your money back like you can out of a mutual fund or a stock. These aren't daily liquid. So a client may very well look to assume an elevated amount of risk through some illiquidity, provided they can still continue to fund operations. And again, one of the steps that we'll go through is determining, okay, how much cash do you need for distribution for your fund holders, for whomever, and can the portfolio continue to do that with less than 100% liquidity? So if you see here on slide 18, you know, the, 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 the very often used uh, efficient frontiers as we take on some liquidity. And so semi-liquid would be things like hedge funds where there is some liquidity to them, although not pure liquid, like on a daily Val mutual fund. And then you could have illiquid assets like private capital, where you might not be able to get your money back in a matter of years. But as we look at the potential risk and return metric for each of these, you can see the benefits of taking on additional risk. And that's ultimately what we're trying to reach here is, is are we going to get compensated for risk? And if we are, then we should consider it. If we're not, then don't. Much the same way when we look at ESG components of a portfolio, <clears throat> we believe that it can help a client identify embedded risks in the portfolio and if we're not getting compensated for those risks, say for example, stranded assets, uh, then we shouldn't be taking those risks. Next slide. So we, we sort of view the world through four broad categories, global equity, global fixed, real assets, and diversifying strategies. <clears throat> and this is in essence a catch-all, all four of these for just about any type of investment. So, Global equity would be just that, stocks, both international, domestic, emerging, developed, public, private, large, small, on down the line. Diversifying strategies or hedge funds would fall into, again, the diversifying strategy bucket. And we sort of view the, the hedge fund world through two different sleeves, absolute return, which is oftentimes a little bit more of a fixed income type of substitute, or hedged equity, like a long short strategy. And again, so when we're trying to work with a client, particularly an ESG client, we're, we're trying to solve a, a couple of different um, uh, conclusions here. So, you know, we need to look at what's the spending requirements for a client, capital requirements, what are the fundraising expectations, what are the previous experiences with staff and committee, because recognize we're more often than not dealing with a volunteer investment committee. What are the risk tolerances? All of these things feed into how much of each of these four buckets do we want to draw out of, uh, to draw out to, to fund? Slide 20, please. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, thanks. So all of this sort of feeds into uh, an asset allocation and we'll construct uh, through, a, again, through a series of, of dialogues with the client, trying to put together what we would, be, what we would deem to be uh, an appropriate portfolio based upon <clears throat> the risk tolerances and the return needs of the client. And what you can see here, and this is an actual client, uh, they have two separate pools. They have an endowment pool, and then they have an ESG pool. And the ESG pool uh, has a higher amount of quasi-endowed types of clients, a greater amount of liquidity required. So what you can see, for example, if you look under diversifying strategies and also under real assets, but certainly under diversifying strategies, there's less of an allocation to hedged equity because the clients in the ESG pool need a greater amount of liquidity. So it's those types of discussions that we have to go through. So <clears throat> when, we're, when we're working with a client, 
you know, all of those items that Matt discussed, you know, they have obvious value for investors. Uh, and, but when an investor approaches them or we approach them on behalf of an investor, you know, they've already made the decision to invest. But there's a whole process that takes place prior to the decision uh, that whether they want to buy or sell, or in this case, not hold, um, to, to, for, for a client to reach that decision, a whole group of, of questions need to be answered. So, for example, when we're looking at someone like uh, Appleseed, the question of, you know, are for-profit prisons or tobacco a place that we want to invest? Well, previous to that, a client needs to say at the most basic level, you know, what is my return goal? And, and how much risk am I willing to take to assume that? And based upon that amount of risk, are hedge funds appropriate? So by the time we reach the decision of approaching a firm like Appleseed, uh, there's a fair amount of information and, and deliberation that's gone on uh, prior to. <clears throat> One of the important aspects that we do is on the due diligence side. And you know, particularly on the semi-liquid and illiquid space, because these are areas that are much more difficult to unring that bell. If you decide that you don't want to be in an investment like a hedge fund or a private capital fund, uh, it's exceedingly difficult to un unwind that compared to, say, just owning uh, a stock or a mutual fund. So we go through background checks on, on the hedge fund manager and staff, uh, review of all of the documents, references, ensuring the process is sound and repeatable. Uh, ensuring that the manager knows both their strengths and their weaknesses and tries to maximize, of course, the strengths and minimize the weaknesses. From an ESG perspective, we need to ensure that there is adherence to the mission, both for the organization as well as the manager, and to make sure that there's commonality in that. Is there any sort of style drift historically? What has been the return generator in the past for the fund, and is that something that we believe that will continue into the future? Uh, has there been mission creep? both from an ESG perspective or from an asset allocation or style drift perspective? Has there been greenwashing or cheating taking place in the portfolio? And, and as you're seeing a, a vast number of, of ESG strategies coming online, some are quite good, others not quite as good. Uh, and it's our responsibility to try to make sure that those decisions are made prior to approaching a manager. You know, the destination as well as the route you take to get there are equally important, particularly in the case of ESG managers. And on the next slide, please. <clears throat> Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we don't end up like the poor gent here in the, on, the, on the caption. Uh, either A, because we've made poor decisions and now we're in a manager that's subpar, or B, we've hired a manager that from an ESG perspective hasn't necessarily matched what the client is after or, or hasn't been what we would expect. Um, what we're trying to do here is make sure that we don't end up out on, out on the street or our clients end up out on the street with a poor decision. With that, I'll turn it over to Paul Herman uh, from uh, Hip Investor. Great, thanks, Tim. And next slide. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to the Intentional Endowments uh, Network. Uh, I'm Paul Herman from HIP Investor. HIP stands for Human Impact and Profit, and we're in our 12th year. Uh, at HIP, we have two companies. We have a ratings company that produces 75,000 ratings across corporate global equities. Uh, that's now up to 7,000. Uh, muni bond issuers across the U.S. in uh, cities, counties, states, as well as schools, hospitals, uh, and utilities. Uh, and then we also rate more than 2,000 mutual funds and ETFs, including hedge funds. Uh, our second company uh, has uh, equity strategies ranging up to eight and a half years performance. Uh, we also offer diversified fossil fuel portfolios, including in 401ks and 403bs. Um, so our clients, uh, Tim talked about serving families, foundations, and um, uh, uh, and endowments. Um, uh, so we support that as well, and have uh, our ratings and investment strategies uh, support uh, hedge funds and fund managers. Uh, if you want to learn more about the HIP methodology after we talk about it today, there's a HIP investor uh, textbook, ebook, and audiobook that's actually in 26 universities, MBA, and MPA programs. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
And of course, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a mixture of past results. Uh, so those are not indicative of future performance. And this is not an offer of securities. Next slide. So uh, Tim showed a very insightful graph around what's the different efficient frontiers for uh, liquid, semi-liquid, and illiquid securities. Here's another take at an efficient frontier developed by uh, Brian Dunn at uh, Quillian. Um, and this layers on impact alongside risk and return. And so there are some new efficient frontiers because ESG factors, including in long short strategies, uh, create a, a sort of a third dimension of what impact you can have on the world in addition to the financial risk and return uh, for your portfolio. And we're finding in clients like uh, Becker College uh, endowment that they have set um, specific uh, impact requirements. Uh, and I think that aligns with uh, organizations like Sierra Club as well. Next slide. So the impact rating of uh, any security that uh, we've built out, and there's ESG ratings from other providers as well, this is a comprehensive impact rating that looks at the products and services uh, of a organization, could be the customers of a business, could be the citizens or citizens of a city, or the beneficiaries of an NGO. And the uh, zero to 100 rating system implies that closer to 100 is utopia and has net positive impact on environment and people and society. Uh, and closer to zero is a dystopia that we hope not to live in. And what we found over 12 years at Hip Investor, analyzing this across 7,000 companies, is that a higher ESG rating or a higher HIP rating uh, tends to um, correlate with lower future risk and stronger future return potential. And a low HIP rating does the opposite. So as you see on the next slide, um, this is the actual um, uh, experience. High ESG ratings, high uh, HIP ratings, uh, have stronger financial performance, and low HIP ratings have lower or even negative performance. So when you're looking at this for a long short strategy, as you can see on the next slide, uh, those extractive companies like Matt talked about that are unethical unsustain and unsustainable are candidates for shorting, divesting, or underweighting. And those on the right-hand side uh, that have strong upside and potential and are gaining business value and lower future risk um, uh, can actually generate positive impact and a positive financial return on, at the same time on a portfolio basis. So then the challenge is how to do this, because in each of these bars, there's uh, outliers that uh, don't fit the overall trend. Um, so how do you make sure and pick the right ones? Um, and go long the right securities and go short the right securities. So on the next slide, uh, these are the 80 hedge funds who are currently signatories of the UNPRI. <clears throat> this is a global list that you can find at the UNPRI. Uh, the first hedge fund down on the bottom, Candrium, uh, joined back in 2006. And the first US hedge fund, Ice Canyon, uh, joined in 2008. Some of you may be familiar with Satori Capital, also in the US, uh, who's active in the ESG community. And then you can check this list and what exposure they have at the UNPRI site. So that's the good news. Um, what's the bad news? Next slide. So if you go into Morningstar to uh, look for a particular um, you know, key word that matches with your mission of an endowment or a foundation or your family office, um, then you search for things like diversity. So good news, two pop out in the hedge fund section of Morningstar. Uh, the bad news is it's diversity of risk. So from uh, that's good if you want to diversify risk, but not if you want to pursue impact. You can type in things like environmental or women or climate or even ESG. This is in the fund name or impact. <clears throat> and currently there's no um, hedge funds that have these elements in their names reporting to Morningstar. So on the next slide, there are a handful that exist in addition to uh, Appleseed's fund. Uh, one of them is uh, Alternative Investment Sustainability. And, uh, but you can see that the financial performance has not lived up to at least an S&P 500 benchmark uh, and a Russell 2000 benchmark. Uh, but you can see on the left-hand side that they integrate ESG criteria. So that's why um, working with uh, firms like FEG and Tim can help you sort out 
the financial risk and return and impact that matches your mission. In this case, they also exclude the 200 largest public coal, oil, and gas, um, um, uh, di you know, exclude and uh, are divested of that. On the next slide, uh, you'll see a second version, the ECOFIN Vista Long Short Fund, uh, and that too has lagged the S&P 500 and Russell 2000. So depending on the risk return profile of what you're seeking and comparing it to a hedge fund index, which is not the benchmark set in Morningstar, it could be a potential fit. So they've had at least positive returns uh, since uh, inception, except for a near break-even year in 2014. So on the next slide, how does this apply in a uh, client environment in an asset owner environment. Uh, so Becker College is a uh, was founded uh, by a couple of the founding fathers in Massachusetts uh, back in the 1700s. So it has a very long history, and uh, Becker College decided that in addition to training its students with an agile mindset for the 80% of future jobs that are not yet invented and uh, incorporating a Muhammad Yunus social business center on campus, one of the uh, 15 worldwide, that they wanted uh, their, in, their endowment to match their mission and to be 100% impactful. So Becker undertook a process um, to uh, educate and inform the board and investment committee. And on the next slide, what they found was that uh, it was possible to both design and implement um, uh, ESG goals into the investment policy statement to um, uh, set specific ESG ratings in the IPS, and in this case, on a zero to 100 scale for absolute impact in the world on people and planet and society, to have that be above 50. And the system that they're using is the HIP rating system. Um, and there'll actually be an article in the Nakubo magazine uh, as part of uh, Intentional Endowment Network um, uh, feature section with uh, Business Officer magazine in this month's March issue. So Becker also set a relative rating. So in ESG, as uh, Matt and Tim and uh, your experience may align with, um, there's what's good for the world and there's what's available to invest in. So to invest in a 100 rated uh, absolute impact stock or fund, um, that is quite difficult. Um, it's easier to invest in a relatively high rated. So you can see these ratings of above 50 that the Becker portfolio shifted in less than a year to being net positive from slightly net negative and to being top quartile versus second quartile. And at the same time, the returns uh, are higher and the risk is lower. And this actually um, shifted, is similar to what Tim talked about, about on what's an ESG asset allocation. Um, this divested some of the structured notes that um, Becker was holding. So those may exist in your portfolio and typically they're around S&P 500 or other indexes. Uh, unfortunately, there's no, they're not yet structured notes around ESG indexes. So from a um, hedged portfolio perspective, uh, the hedging is designed into the equity fixed income allocation. And part of that is paid for, in this case, Becker is working with Morgan Stanley. Part of that is paid for by the lower fees that are available through SMA, separately managed accounts, on the Morgan Stanley platform. Um, so those include funds like uh, Breckenridge fixed income and other equity man and then and equity managers. Um, uh, so Becker in this case you, uh, continues to use some alternatives, uh, but they're looking for those in uh, natural resources like water or sustainable forestry, and less so in the traditional financial engineering of stock market indexes that include the risks of extractive companies. Okay, next slide. And um, so what this means for your portfolio is one of the ways you can visualize your portfolio is on a risk return curve. This is not a 3D chart, this is a 2D chart. It's uh, difficult to graph in Excel or even Tableau in 3D, at least without virtual reality glasses. So what this shows in this 2D chart is the size of the bubbles of the asset allocation in this $100 million family office client um, that HIP has worked with that the three-year risk return performance is plotted uh, against the latest version of the Morningstar Efficient Frontier. And then the asset classes are coded by uh, color-coded green, yellow, red based on their ESG or in this case HIP impact score. 
So you can use this as a one page visual. We found that this is great for investment committees to use um, uh, and boards to use because it cuts across some of the grids that um, those of us who are quant geeks love. This uh, uh, v effectively visualizes it. And so what you can see is that red uh, hedge fund circle was a large allocation for this family office portfolio um, that actually was not that transparent, quite opaque, as many hedge funds um, are, are difficult to see inside the holdings, <clears throat> and was doing okay from a risk return perspective for the time period it was in, uh, invested in. So in this case, the family office, next slide, wanted to say, well, are we in the right hedge funds, and do they align with our mission? So we're going to play a game of 20 questions. We're not going to go through all 20. We're going to show you a handful of them. If you'd like the full 20 questions list, feel free to email us after the webinar at paul at hip investor. <clears throat> and so we'll just give you a couple samples and then we'll go to questions. So the first is explain your investment strategy and approach. Um, so as Matt introduced at the beginning, there's many hedge strategies and you should be able to explain them as a uh, investment expert uh, on the board or investment committee uh, or among your principals. And if you cannot explain it, then that's uh, one risk. Um, and in this case, we were screening for who is, has a fundamental uh, strategy, similar to what Matt uh, explained in the fundamentals under the each long and each short in the Appleseed Fund, versus technical trading or high friction, high uh, transaction, uh, high frequency transactions. On the next slide, uh, a, a second critical question is how transparent are the holdings? Some hedge funds say that it's their secret sauce and they won't share the holdings. This is a risk for an investor. If you don't know what's inside your portfolio, um, that is a future risk of surprises. On the next slide, uh, you'll see the next question. Uh, do you evaluate environmental social impacts of your holdings? And uh, depending on whether you do and to what detail, uh, today in Morningstar, there are no globe ratings. Um, uh, globes are the star equivalent of ESG and sustainability at Morningstar. So you can see those on equity funds, but you can't yet, they have not calculated them on hedge funds. And then the final set of questions that we'll show you from 20 questions is, what percent of the portfolios manages liquid assets are invested in the strategy? What are the management and incentive fees? And so the challenge in hedge funds is that the fees are, can be quite high, including a performance fee. And so the net return has to exceed uh, both those incentive and management fees. So next slide. So if you want to see all 20 questions, happy to share them with you. So give us an email. And on the next slide, I will uh, wrap up by saying um, that the value and benefits of ESG in your portfolio, including long short, is to analyze and reduce future risks, which uh, Matt and Tim will talk about in Q&A, to better understand the drivers of returns, and to create higher impact portfolios. Next slide. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have uh, offices in uh, staff in Chicago, LA, San Francisco, and uh, I'm usually in seat 21A on a plane. Um, so look forward to your questions in the webinar. Great, thank you so much to each of you for those wonderful presentations. And if you could each go ahead and take yourselves off mute, we'll jump into some questions here. And for our audience, please do continue to type your questions into the chat box in the control panel, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So to start off, kind of backtracking here with a question for Matt. Outside of excluding companies providing unsustainable products and services, from your presentation, it looks like there's an emphasis in Appleseed's strategy on the governance side of ESG. Does a company's business strategy in terms of environmental and social factors impact investment decisions? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, now I'll start by saying that uh, governance um, tends to be uh, a pretty big, a pretty big factor in that. Um, you know, we, we've seen. I, I think with this uh, long bull market we've had, I think a lot of investors have. Uh, Sort of gone soft on on governance. Um, they've become rather insensitive to corporate governance factors, and so we see a lot of opportunities there. Um, but uh, with that said, certainly uh, social and environmental factors um, can can help us to to find good uh, short candidates. Um, you know, what one example is Westmoreland Coal. Um, you know, we we we've shorted Westmoreland Coal. 
um, based on that environmental thesis. Um, and you know, I, I think that going forward, you you could see a lot a lot more of those types of um, short strat or short theses um, related to environmental issues. Um, you know, we I mentioned uh, Big Five sporting goods earlier. Um, which is really on the on the social side of things um, related to the sale of guns and ammunition. Um, so governance, as I mentioned, is has recently been a really big driver, I think, of some of the the short themes. Um, but it's certainly not been the only driver. We also see a lot of opportunities with environmental and uh, and social factors. Great, and sort of along those same lines. How did you discover Valiant's fraudulent accounting and at what point did you put your short position on and were you ever a long holder of that company? Uh, no, we, we, we've certainly never been a long holder of Valiant. Um, and, and we weren't the, the original, um, you know, people who found um, those issues. Um, but we, we, we shorted it at, at $120 um, and covered it at 20. Um, but it, we, we were among a number of, of, of investors who felt that the, uh, the governance issues at Valiant were significant before the market as a whole actually uh, started to agree with us. Um, but we were not alone in that trade. Um, you know, we, we knew that there were some things going on at Valiant that were, um, you know, untenable. And um, so, but we, we were, I guess, in that, that smaller group that, that decided that the company was way overvalued given those risks. Um, and, and we were certainly not early. Um, you know, there were, there were other people who were in before us on the short side of that. Um, so that, that, I guess that's sort of the, uh, my, my response to that type of question. Great. And Tim and Matt talking about institutional quality, ESG, hedge funds. How do you both think about scale with these strategies? I guess uh, this is Matt. I'll, uh, I'll jump in and, and then um, and Tim can, can join me. Um, but, you know, I, we are actually, we are actually in, um, you know, a hedge fund of funds um, as, as a component. Um, and you know, we as a firm, we have uh, roughly a billion dollars under under management, so we have a, a robust operations staff. Um, so you know, we we have a significant capacity um, for growth. And yet, you know, the, the the strategy itself is still nascent and and small uh, on a relative basis. But as a as a firm, we have the capacity to to grow that strategy significantly. Um, and I would say, just if we're looking at the that broader market for this type of strategy. I think there's a significant amount of sort of pent up demand. I think that a lot of um, the investors who would have an interest in these types of strategies simply don't know that, that some of them are out there yet. Um, but, it, but it is a problem for the market. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly the, the, the demand for ESG hedge funds is less than it is for just traditional hedge funds. And I don't necessarily view that as a negative. Um, there's a fair amount of crowding within the hedge fund space, as I'm sure Matt can attest. And to have ESG investors looking for a criteria that might not necessarily make it into a traditional hedge fund um, may very well provide a better risk-adjusted portfolio. ESG investors also tend to be a little bit more long-term focused, which certainly helps in, in some fairly volatile swings. So, I mean, as we look at the asset size for ESG hedge funds, um, yes, the average fund size is is probably smaller, but once again, I view that as a positive, not a, not a negative. Um, you know, just given the sheer volume of dollars that are out there looking for return, um, a hedge fund manager probably has an easier job of employing a smaller amount of dollars than a multi-billion dollar type of hedge fund. Okay. And Tim, could you talk about what percentage of your client base, specifically endowment clients, seek to align their investments with their mission and incorporate ESG strategies and out of those strategies, what they generally pursue? Sure. 
So, you know, of the, of the roughly 60 plus billion dollars of assets under advisement, we have about 4.5, 4.6 billion dollars of assets where the clients have some sort of um, socially responsible or ESG criteria in their investment policy statement. Um, now that's going to vary from, <clears throat> again, issue specific like the Truth Initiative to a much more holistic ESG. Um, for those clients that are looking to put together holistic ESG portfolios, um, we try to populate across the entire spectrum. And rec recall those four buckets that we showed. Um, we find that there's opportunity within each of the broad asset classes and even in the sub asset classes for ESG so that we don't necessarily believe that you have to take a lesser quality portfolio or a lesser quality manager simply by virtue of being ESG. And Paul, could you provide a little more detail on how the HIP rating system works and if there is a document that you could share with participants that provide this information and talk a little bit about the sources of data that inform your rating system? Sure, happy to. Um, the, you know, a good ESG system, and uh, we've tried to uh, design ours to be the most comprehensive, um, is looks at um, the human, environmental, and social factors of a company and how they operate, employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction, uh, as well as greenhouse gas intensity and gender board board diversity related to gender, uh, as well as legal exposure. Those are five of the highest operating metrics that you can look at um, from a high correlation to future risk and return. <clears throat> but what a strong ESG system does is to evaluate the products and services, and in our case at HIP, the revenue weighting by industry and by sector um, and and we're available by product. And so this is what we've done with uh, Newsweek Green Ratings in the past is rate the underlying uh, product revenues and industry segment revenues. And today, given demand from European pensions and endowments and mission-driven endowments, those are being connected to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so that's an effective part. And because um, ESG products and services that produce a positive benefit, tend to have double digit revenue like companies like Unilever are experiencing. Uh, you get higher revenue growth as well as uh, lower risk from the EST metrics. And then the third part is the management practices and things like is the board accountable for ESG and holding the CEO accountable? And are the cost accounting and managerial accounting systems incorporating ESG factors uh, just like some uh, companies do uh, at the, in, the ca in the capital allocation process for the company for new products and R&D. So all of this is explained in the HIP Investor book uh, in a 250-page book that I wrote uh, uh, so that my mom could understand it. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, information on the HIP Investor website where we also have extracts from the book. Um, and then there's videos um, uh, on the website as well. Um, that uh, explain in 10 minutes and one hour and longer um, uh, what are the strong factors that uh, both do good and make money uh, for your portfolio. Great. And Matt, could you talk a bit about your long-short ratio, why it's that way, and in the long portfolio, how ESG factors impact your buy, hold, and sell decisions? Sure. Um, so right now, um, our positioning is that we're, we're actually, um, about 25% net short. Um, you know, our, our mandate allows us to go, um, kind of, you know, we, we have a lot of flexibility. Um, and the, the reason for that, um, that net short positioning right now, uh, part of that is just simply valuation. Um, you know, we, we see, we see very expensive markets out there. Um, and, and we think that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of risk um, in, the, in the market broadly. And uh, so just part of that's just valuation. Um, but but another, another part of it is simply, as I mentioned earlier, after such a long bull market, um, investors are really ignoring 
a lot of risk factors. They're ignoring a lot of uh, corporate, corporate governance issues. Uh, we see a lot of covenant light bonds, uh, very aggressive accounting. Um, and so we, we have price insensitive and, and governance insensitive investors. And this is really leading to um, a lot of compelling uh, short candidates for us. So, um, you know, those, those two things together have, have sort of driven, um, driven us more to the short side. Um, now to the, to the second part of the question there on, on the long side, um, you know, what we've, we've been in the ESG space on the long side for quite a while. We, you know, we launched our, um, our 40 act fund in 2006 as an ESG fund. Um, and so the way we're incorporating ESG there and on the long side of our long short strategy, um, first there's, there's simply the screening factor. So we, you know, we screen out, um, certain companies who engage in, in different business practices such as alcohol, tobacco, firearms, pornography, gambling, and, um, fossil fuels. So, um, for both our, our 40 act fund and our long short fund, we, we apply all those screens. Um, then, then on a, a, a less um, quantitative basis, we're, we're looking for companies that are engaging in businesses uh, or, or um, business models where they have strong um, social and environmental um, sort of uh, tailwinds that we think have, have a long runway um, to, to help them compound value over time. So, you know, as an example, you, um, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, um, is a, is a big holding, um, on the long side. And, you know, JLL is, uh, just a fantastic company from an ESG perspective. They have a very diverse workforce. Um, they have, they employ literally thousands of people as sustainability experts within the firm. Um, they have, um, just fantastic ESG ratings across the board. And, um, so, and that's a company that, um, that, that we love. And, um, so, you know, they, they just, they sort of, um, they embody all, all of those, those good things that we look for in a company. Um, and uh, like an, another example is uh, Titan international, which, which makes, um, wheels and tires for, um, uh, farm equipment and construction equipment. And one of the things they're doing is they, they've actually created, um, a reclamation process for reclaiming old, uh, like mining and, and construction equipment tires. Um, so you're significantly reducing the amount of this dangerous, uh, waste from, from these tires. So we, we look for these types of things, um, in companies on the long side. Um, and you know, some of that is quantitative, some of it is more qualitative, um, but that, that's all incorporated in our, uh, investment process. Great, thank you. So it looks like we are about out of time. So I'd like to thank Matt, Tim, and Paul for the great discussion. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us this afternoon. Um, if any of you would like to offer a closing statement, you certainly can at this point. Hi, this is Paul. Um yeah, so it's it's your money, and the, I think the key thing is to know your future risk and know all the holdings inside your portfolio, not just all the fund managers. Um, so one additional tool for knowing the holdings is our HIP ratings are available on a on a portal um, that's uh, that you can look at candidates for longing and shorting. Um, so uh, appreciate uh, everybody inside the Intentional Endowment Network being intentional with their endowments, so we can shift society. Uh, this is this is Tim. Probably the only thing I would close with is <clears throat> reassuring uh, those investors that are wrestling with the idea of uh, having to make a decision between an, uh, a properly put together portfolio from a fiduciary perspective and an ESG portfolio. It's not an either or proposition uh, and that the world in which we exist today, you can build out a very diversified institutional quality, well-constructed portfolio that can also match the values of your organization. Uh, yeah, this is Matt. I'll, I will uh, just close by saying, you know, shorting um, has been a really unpopular strategy uh, recently as we've, as we, as we've seen this huge run-up 
um, in equities. So, so really now is a great time to be thinking about um, incorporating that type of strategy into a portfolio. Um, it adds really important portfolio diversification. Uh, and, and just as a data point, I know um, a lot of people follow the, what the Yale endowment is doing. And, and recently it was disclosed that uh, roughly 25% of the Yale endowment is, is in hedged equity now. Um, and, and I think that, that reflects um, what, I'm, what I'm saying here, that it now is really a good time to be uh, considering that type of portfolio diversification after it's been really an unpopular place to be over time. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again. And if any of our participants have any questions about this webinar, the work of our panelists, or activities happening in the Intentional Endowments Network, please do be in touch. Our contact information is showing on the screen now. And again, this webinar will be up on our website shortly. So thank you all and have a great afternoon.